Okay, so um, my name is Randy Witt. I'm from the Intel Open Source Technology Center. The talk is a super long title, um, cross-platform enablement for the Yocto project with containers. Um, cross-platform not just meaning Windows and Mac, but across Ubuntu distro, or across Linux distros and everything else. Um, so let's get started with uh, talking a little bit about my personal problems. I have a lot of them. Um, but in, with regards to this, just what got me started working on this in the first place, um, it wasn't the idea of, oh, I'm going to go cre create this thing that people are going to go consume. It was, these things are annoying me. What can I do to make these things not annoy me anymore? Um, and so the first problem was the multiple distro problem. So for instance, in the Octo project, um, we do QA on an auto builder. And so we're building across multiple distros to make sure that when somebody else is doing that, the builds work and everything else. So when one of those builds fails, um, and it looks like it's only failing on a particular distro, uh, my options at the time were actually to SSH into the auto builder, clone the repo again, set up a build directory, and then run the build actually on that builder. Um, that's, a, that's a pain for me. I don't like that because I already have a workspace set up on my workstation where I'm already doing all my work. Um, the second way to do it would be you could go create a virtual machine for all the n number of distros that you're testing against um, and d decide to run one of those when you need it or leave them all running, which is almost impossible unless you have a you know, ton of RAM. Um, and you could go try it there. Um, and those options I didn't like. Um, there's a lot of overhead for me. Um, so that was the first real problem that um, started driving this. Another one was that BitBake sometimes leaks processes. So if you're doing a build or something and you control C to kill it, um, it will try to clean everything up, but it doesn't always do that, right? And sometimes you'll notice that it looks like it doesn't even want to respond at all, and then you'll go kill BitBake, and then all the processes that it spawned are um, lying around. And so then you have to manually find them and kill them if you can tell what they are, or you might not even know that that happened, and, um, and that's not good either. So I didn't like that. That really bothered me. So those are the two main problems. I don't have a slide for the fact that running Toaster um, was a pain for me as well, um, <laughs> and a lot of setup. So, but that was another one, because there is a Toaster container I'm going to talk about. So this is about containers and particularly Docker as a solution. That's what I used. It's not that you have to use that, but that's what I did because it, um, uh, it was making my life easy. That's what all this was about. Um, so I'm going to try to do a quick overview of containers and then also Docker, um, but it's limited time and there's lots of demos and I'm trying to get through everything. So um, um, it's a very quick overview. And I wish I had more time. Um, the first thing I'd say is containers aren't magic, because I've talked to a lot of people. And, um, and it's, you know, they're based on uh, Linux kernel features. Um, and they were there, and then people just started using them, and this container concept came out. Um, and it's not that the kernel features aren't awesome and amazing, but it's that it's just containers are leveraging these great things about the Linux kernel. So what enables containers as we know them right now is the Linux kernel. So, and we're at the embedded Linux conference, so Linux is great is basically what this is saying. Um, but what it does is there's, there's two, con two main concepts that they're using. One is namespaces, which it uses for isolation. And so I listed three here, but there are actually more namespaces than this. And so um, there's PID network and mount uh, listed here. Um, and those are the common ones that you would be thinking about if you were using a container. So there's a command called unshare um, that you can install on Linux. And, and you can switch to a different namespace using this unshare command. And in the simplest terms, running unshare and just switching to a different namespace for like processes or network or whatever, you're essentially getting a container at that point. Um, but most of the time, things like Docker and um, some of the other tools, they also use C groups, and that's for the process encapsulation 
Um, and then even doing dynamic resource management of like, I, wanna, I only want to run these two CPUs, or I want to run with you know, X amount of RAM instead. Um, but that's just another kernel feature. Again, systemd uses that. I mean, everything that runs in systemd, for instance, is ran in a C group. Um, and containers are just leveraging that as well. Um, so particularly with the C groups is the bit-bake leaking processes um, slide that are the problem is C groups are fixing that is because if you kill, if you look at the C group and you kill something in it, everything that's in that C group goes away. So I don't have to worry about it escaping. Um, and so the last bullet is just pretty much the tooling that you're using to run containers are going to be using these Linux kernel features. Um, and so I, I put this slide in here to maybe make containers not seem so intimidating that somebody just went and invented something out of the blue. Um, you can build them up from the ground just using Linux kernel features. And I threw this quick slide in here um, just as an example of like if I did do a PID namespace. So in the top part where it says inside container, that's a shell running in a container. Um, and so what I did is I ran a command, sleep 5000, backgrounded it, and then I run ps to show me the details about that process. So in the top, you can see that the PID is 32. Well, outside of the container, I ran the exact same ps command to show me what that process was, but you see that the PID is 8257 there. It's the exact same process, but for all the container nodes and everything that runs in the container, sleep 5000 is PID 32. So that's what it's doing, is it's containing that um, process space. But it's just using a uh, PID namespace um, from the kernel to do that. So the other thing is Docker specifically, right? And uh, I mean, the nice thing about Docker, or one of the nice things is like, even if I don't talk about something, there's tons of documentation on Docker, you know, loads of it on the internet. So um, you could probably find every answer that you had a question about, um, basic question about on Stack Overflow, um, because somebody's answered it. Um, but the simple idea is that there's a thing called a Docker file that um, has commands in it that say how to build an image. Um, so I want to install some things or um, run some particular commands to create the image. And you go and you, you write this Docker file and then you build an image from it. And then what it does is when you run a container, it's actually a temporary instance of that image. So basically a snapshot. Um, so any changes that did you would make to the file system um, in the container will go away when the container exits, right? They're temporary or ephemeral. Um, so you can commit those changes back, but you actually have to take extra action to do that. And so usually what you'll do to get around that is actually bind mount something in where you're actually going to put output. Um, so here's a sample Docker file, super simple, um, and you don't have to understand this completely. Like I said, there's a lot of documentation about this. Um, but the first line is just saying, I want to base this on this image that already exists. So in this particular case, I'm basing it on Ubuntu 16.04. So that means I can use app get and everything else that I would normally get in Ubuntu 16.04. Um, so then the next command just says, hey, I want you to go run this um, to install Python. So I go install Python into this image. So that would make sure that when I run an instance of this image, it's going to have Python in it. So I can use it. And then the last, the last um, line is just what runs, what command actually runs when I say, hey, actually, or actu um, go start the container. Uh, so in this particular case, even though I installed Python, which is just useless for um, this, uh, if I said run the container, all it's going to do is say hello from inside the container and then exit. Uh, it would be a very simple container. So the way that you would run, the con run a container is with the docker run command. Um, and this is basically the format that every single docker run uh, used in the presentation would follow. Um, and so the first two arguments are the dash dash rm and then the dash it. Um, and for the most part, in all of this, you can just ignore them. Um, 
but essentially what's happening is RM, when Docker run starts a container, after the container exit, it, it leaves it around. Um, and there's no reason for that if you're running a container, doing something, and then leaving, and you never plan to start that exact same instance of the image again. Um, so that's all that is. Um, it's nothing super special. Um, and you could leave it off and it would still work. Um, this is just trying to help keep your system clean because you'll just have oodles of containers laying around if you don't. Um, the next one is just saying, hey, I can actually type into the terminal and it will do something um, and give me a TTY. Um, the next one, the dash V, is a really important one because it's saying expose foo into the container as slash bar. And you don't have to call it slash bar, but I, I put it this way to try to illustrate what's happening. So essentially, if you have a di directory called slash foo on your host system, and you ran this command, when you were inside of the container, it would show up as slash bar. And if you know what bind mounts are, that's actually how it's achieving this. Um, and the last option is the name of the image that I want to run. So this could be Ubuntu 16. Uh, dash, or dot 04, or in this case, C1, um, as the example. So I tried to put this together to maybe visually illustrate how this is fitting together. So of course you have Linux here, and I have a directory called um, slash foo on it. Nothing special. Um, so this is a command that I had had before. I left out the dash rm and dash it for space reasons and to try to focus the um, attention. So what happens when I run this? Well, of course, Docker's going to start. And he's going to then, after that, he says, I'm going to create this container for you. And then he says, OK, now I'm going to expose foo into this container as slash bar. And that's really all that's happening. And the reason I left the, the box around bar the same as foo is because it's really the same thing. It's just called something different. Um, and so then if I ran another command to say, hey, Docker, I want you to run another container called C2, and I want to expose foo as baz, that's all that's going to happen. And C1 and C2 are completely different, and they don't know anything about each other unless you explicitly tell them to. Um, and they're seeing the same data called different things, and that's really all there is to it. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the containers that I actually pushed out to Docker Hub, or the images, uh, more correctly. Um, and a little, go through some demos um, and just try to show you like what's available in case you were interested. So the first one, although potentially a terrible name, but like I said, I never expected anybody to be uh, using this, was the Pocky container. Um, it does work with OE Core. And Bitbake. So if you if you checked out if you cloned Bitbake and were using OE Core instead, that would work as well. Um, at least according to a coworker of mine, I haven't done it yet, but he does it all the time. Um, and so this is what the command would look like if you were going to run the Pocky container. Um, the first part should look very familiar. Is the boilerplate RMIT. I'm saying in this particular case, bind mount this my stuff directory in and expose it as slash work dir. And then um, this other argument that dash dash work dir at the end, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. So the default right now is based on Ubuntu 14.04. Richard just told me that they have deprecated that out of the release cycle for um, the Yocto project now, so that will soon say default based on Ubuntu 16.04 because that's the new LTS. That'll be really easy to change. Um, it's basically that if you remember the from line in that Docker file, that's all I have to change. Um, you can use a different distro for this. We because I built a, a lot of them uh, because that was one of my problems that I was trying to solve, um, and. On that line, you see all I changed to say I want to run on Fedora 24 rather than the default of Ubuntu 14.04 is this one, one argument. And then a completely different thing that's going to run. So here's uh, the, the work dir argument. And it's just basically, it has more functionality than this, but I'm trying to not overwhelm 
you while still explaining things. Um, but it's essentially where am I going? Where is my shell going to be at when I actually get dropped to a shell inside of this container? So I'm going to get dropped to a shell and then run git clone or whatever else I want to run. What is the CWD? Um, and then all of these containers that I've created, um, you can pass dash dash help to them, and they will tell you what arguments you can pass to them. Um, and I'll actually show that in my demo. Um, and so here are all the distros that I currently have, um, or that we currently have on Docker Hub. Um, and I'm more than willing to add new ones if you do pull requests. If you look at the format, it's relatively straightforward. Um, and very quickly, I'll just say, the way this is all set up is that when you do a pull request, it will automatically run some builds on Travis to make sure it works. It does some smoke tests. And then I can say, OK, yeah, I'm going to commit that and push it. But yeah, the, all this stuff happens like automatically. And, and all of these are rebuilt uh, once a week as well, because I'm trying to pick up um, newer versions of packages in case there are CVE fixes or anything like that. Um, I, I could do a talk about that. but um, So now we're doing a demo. Um, and, and I screencast this because I actually run full builds and stuff like that. And so I can speed up time in certain places. but. Um, make it so that everything's kind of connected for you. And it never seems like, oh, well, now let me skip to the part where I've magically had all this stuff run that you didn't get to see run. If I can, there's my mouse. Hey, what did it? Well, great. OK, so here we're running the. Uh, are creating a work directory. And now I'm, which is where all my output's going to go. And how did I get here? Uh, it skipped like 20 slides on me, I'm sorry. OK. So we're going to go run the Pocky. No, it skipped four. God. This is media for me, right? Does anybody have any idea why it's doing that? I have no. Huh? Yeah, and I mean, and what it's doing is it's not actually playing where I'm at. OK, there it goes. Sorry. OK, so we're fir I'm first running the command with dash dash help, like I said you could run, just to show that you can. And then I go create a work directory, which is where all my output's going to go. This is completely the wrong one. Huh? Just one more time. I hate PowerPoint, by the way. Yes. So let me pause it now. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so this is the first, you can see that I ran help with the, the Pocky, the crops Pocky image, like I said that you could do. Um, and so the first thing I'm doing is I'm just creating a work dir, where which is where all my output's going to go, that the, is the directory that I'm going to bind mount into the container. Now I'm actually going to go run the container. Um, should look really familiar based on like the previous slides. And so the thing I'm highlighting here in red is you can tell that you're, in this particular case, an indication that I'm running in the container is my shell prompt has changed, right? It says, now I'm this guy called Pocky user, and I've got this crazy hash here, or UID. Um, and that's what uh, Docker's doing is it's saying, oh, my host name is this magic UID that got created. You can change that, but it doesn't really matter. 
So now that I know that I'm in the container, I can um, be sure to do whatever I want to do. And in this case, I'm going to act like I don't have anything, and I'm doing what I would normally do if I were going to use the Octo project, which is go clone Pocky. So I do a clone of Pocky. It happens really fast because of magic. And, and you can see the Pocky directory there. And then, of course, the next thing you would do right, is you're going to source OE init build env, um, which is all happening in the container, just like you would normally do. And then you're going to go run um, whatever commands you would want to run. But before I do that, what I'm going to do is, what I've done is on the, I've used tmux to do this, but the top half is the container, right? That's running in the container. And all tmux has done is opened a shell for me in the bottom that is not running in the container. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to edit the configuration file um, outside of the container um, to just point out that you can use all the tools on your host to do your editing and everything like that. You don't have to do that in the container. Um, you can just use the container for building, which is what it's for. So I go and I add um, rmwork to this config file outside of the container. I change back up to the shell in the container, and I just say, hey, show me what's at the end of my configuration. And you can see the rmwork is there because my work dir on the outside is the same thing as slash work dir inside of the container. So now we're actually going to do real work, which is bit bake, and this is going to be the fastest bit bake build you've ever seen from scratch. Um, so magic, more magic happening, and so I've finished my build, and so I should have core image core image minimal now. And and so I'm going to ls the directory where the image output would normally be to show you, yeah, there's actually an image there. So there they are. So core image minimal, lots of, lots of them. So now I exit out and I say, now my container's not running. Well, let's go see what's in my work dir build, temp, deploy, images. And I should see the same thing. And there they all are, right? The container's no longer running, but since I bind mounted that directory and it worked. So now I'm going to go run the command again, the exact same command, but because if you remember, I said all I have to do is change one little thing, is I change that to now study Debian 8 after it, right? So I run the same command. Now I'm running in a container that's actually based on Debian 8 rather than Ubuntu 14.04. All I do is source OE init build in again, like I did before. And I say bit bake core image minimal. Now, normally this would be almost a no op, but because I added RM work, it actually has to do a few other things. But it's really using the same thing. You can see that it didn't uh, download anything new or go run a bunch of extra tasks that it wouldn't normally do. Um, and the only reason that it even ran the rootfs again is because I turned on RM work, and that's just something that happens. Um, so that's the Pocky container. So now I have another one. There's another one called the Extensible SDK container. If you've heard talk about the Extensible SDK, like if you were at the BOF or something like that, um, or uh, Tim may even have alluded to it if you were in his talk, and actually Henry is doing a talk about it tomorrow, um, or this afternoon, sorry. Um, it, yeah. Um, this, is a, this is a container that is essentially for the purpose of downloading an Extensible SDK and dropping you to a shell ready to run any of the commands that you would normally run in the SDK without having to source the environment scripts or anything like that. Um, it does work with the regular SDK as well, um, the non-extensible SDK. Um, this is just one more time of this is what I named it when I originally <laughs> created it, and it hasn't been changed yet. Um, but I've highlighted in red essentially the part that is different from the other Docker commands that I was running, or the other instance that I just previously ran of the Pocky container, which you can see that I have crops ext SDK container now, which is the image name, and the argument, which you would be able to see if you ran dash dash help, of the URL. And this is where does the um, installer for the SDK live? Um, and so if it's already been set up, it will look at the directory and try to set, and see, oh, there's an SDK here. Um, I'm not going to go download that for you because it's going to overwrite this. And so if you were going to run it and you've already like set it up, you would just leave it off. And I'll show an example of that. 
So more demo. Let's see if I can get it to not magically jump forward. So I'm running this again um, with dash dash help. You can actually see the dash dash URL argument. It tells you what it is. Um, and actually a work dir argument, which I'm not using, but it's all in the help. Um, so now you, I'm going to go create a work dir again, just to start from scratch. Clear the screen. <laughs> um, and then run Docker to run the extensible SDK container. And I'm, pat, and I'm going to put the URL for like one of the SDKs that is published as part of the releases for the Yocto project. So here it is downloading it. This is all sped up again because it takes time. Um, and it's setting up the extensible SDK. And now you're at a shell ready to run any of the SDK commands. So it says I can run DevTool help. So let me run DevTool help and see what happens. Ah, it worked. Magic. So now if I run DevTool build image, which would be a common thing for you to do, it's going to actually go build the image. And it's, this is all running in the container, right? So you can see the output that is created. Um, and I can exit out of the container. And I'm trying to set up a, process, or a, a mode of thinking here. Get it, is I'm going to look in the work dir, and I see that the same thing is in the work dir that I bind mounted in, even though the container is no longer running. So now if I try to run it again with the URL, like I said, he's going to yell at you, and he says he's a big coward, and he's not going to overwrite anything. So all I do is I run it again, and I go back and just delete the URL part. So now I ran it, but he didn't do any setup because he says, hey, there's already an SDK here. I don't have to do that. But I can just go immediately into running SDK commands again without sourcing any scripts or doing anything else. And you can see that he didn't do anything because he didn't need to because I had already ran, uh, had already ran DevTool build image. So now I'm going to delete that work directory and start from scratch again to show you this other, the other mode is because it's common that you might download an SDK manually and just already have it on your disk, right? And so I showed where you said, go download this for me. But here I'm just going to use wget to download the exact same thing that I downloaded before, except use the SDK or the container to do. So now I've downloaded it and I, you can look in the work dir and see that it's called mysdk.sh, right? So I'm going to run the container again, and I'm going to give it the URL option. But you can give it an absolute path. And so here's what's happening, is I put it in the directory that's being exposed to the container. And so then the contain now the container can see it. And so you use the absolute path that would exist as it is in the container, because otherwise he doesn't know about it. So now I can go run this. And he didn't download anything. He's just extracting and setting up the SDK for you. So if you've got them downloaded, or multiple ones that you've downloaded manually, um, you can run it that way instead. And so even if you just don't like the tedium of running the installer and then running the setup scripts and doing all of those things, you could just use this as like, I'm super lazy. Do this for me. And Brian, if he's in here, does that all the time because he's really, really lazy. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry. Um, no, I like Brian a lot. Um, so last one I'm going to demo um, is the toaster container. It's very simple. It runs toaster, and if anybody's ever tried to run toaster, you want to like hit things sometimes when you try to set it up and get it running. Um, I've highlighted in red again the things that you should pay attention to. There's this dash p argument that can be passed to toaster. And that's essentially, um, if you look at this, let's start with the last part of that, which is the 8,000. So by default, toaster runs on port 8,000. right? So what I've done in this command is I've said, OK, well, when you run this, this time, expose it to 18,000. You can do 8,000 again. I just made it different so you can see there's, you can pick what that is. So you say, run it on port 18,000. And I say, run it on 127.0.0.1, because I only want to show, show it on local host. I don't want everybody on my network to be able to see this. You don't have to do that, but I yell at people that don't. So um, because there other, there's no authentication mechanism for Toaster, and basically, then they can just go start running things on your machine if they find the page. So local host is good. 
So here we're going to go run this stuff. More fun. Same thing. I've you know setting a process. Hopefully, create a work directory. Um, you see that I, I'm adding this new argument to it that says, "Hey, run this on port 18,000 instead." Um, and bind mounting the directory in or specifying where it's at. Saying, "Hey, go do toaster." So it goes and it starts up toaster. Um, and it's actually faster than if you did the first run of Toaster yourself, because normally when Toaster runs, it downloads a bunch of stuff from the layer index and all of these other things. The Toaster container has already been primed with all that information. So it's, it did it for you. So now you can see it created some files here. Um, and so let's switch over to web browser now, right? Because this is where you run Toaster stuff. And so I could go in here and I say, okay, show me what's running on localhost 18,000. And I get the toaster splash page, right? I'm actually going to go in here and go through the, the steps of actually saying build something. So I go create a project. I go over to the build and I say, let's build core image minimal because that's what I've been doing and everything else. And I say build. And once again, by magic time travel, I make this happen super fast. And it finishes, and I can have, um, and this is what you would normally see on a toaster output screen, right? But this ran in a container on my Linux workstation. And you can see, okay, well, I have some output on the shell that toaster spit out as well, where it was doing some work. Let's go down and let's see what's in build toaster 2, where it would have put the output. Are my images actually there? Well, they should be. So there they are, right? Just like in the other examples, except now Toaster ran this for me. Um, so if I exit out of the container, I can go run, um, I think I do, yeah. So I'll go run um, Docker again, the exact same command. And the reason I'm doing this is to show, well, I just ran this one run of Toaster, and I created this output. Let's use the same work directory and see what happens when I go to the Toaster web page now. Oh, well, it remembered, right? Because the instance of the container was just writing data out into my work directory. None of that's preserved in the container. The container is just running toaster and using data that I, uh, or using a directory that I told it to use. So ran the container, generated some output, exited the container, and I can go back and run it any other time and get back to where I was in my toaster state. So um, that's all of the ones. Um, Actually, there's another one, but I don't have time to talk about it. These are the important ones. So, um, so other platforms, right? That's really compelling and interesting to a lot of people. Why? Um, because BitBake does not run natively on Windows or Mac. Um, and there are technical limitations to not, I won't go into a lot of detail, not just running BitBake, but the problem is you have all this metadata that's going to go build all of this other stuff. And the problem is, whatever it does has to also work natively on Windows and Mac. And so all the tools that you might use, all the native tools or whatever, you have to make all the, all the metadata and everything that it does also work. And that's very difficult. So, and I say running containers on Mac OS because that's what I'm going to demo today. Um, so uh, the difference is basically our setup. And there are instructions at this link. Um, and I think they're trying to move them to the Yocto Project Wiki um, instead. Uh, but if, if they're lacking, if you go try to do this and they're lacking or something, please tell us. Um, and we'll update them. Because the idea is that if you want to use this, it's easy to use, not, well, let's go get tribal knowledge everywhere of how to do this. Um, so that's the first thing, and I'm not going to go through that because that's a lot of, it doesn't really follow the trend of what I've been doing here. Um, the other thing that's different is it actually runs in a hypervisor, so we're running Linux. That's what's happening. Um, and because Linux is great and what lets us do containers, right? Um, and the other thing is it uses a Docker volume rather than a bind mount, and, and how to create one of these is in the instructions. Um, and 
And basically, it's ba Docker owns this data rather than you're bind mounting something indirectly from your host, right? And I try to go through this in this diagram again. So here's where we left off on Linux, right? Um, so now what's, what's going to change? So if you see where it had slash foo before, I've changed this to vol. And that, because that's like the name of the volume that I'm telling Docker to use. Um, so it's not on absolute path anymore. So I've changed my command. So let's go through what is different, right? The first thing is that, OK, yeah, I'm running on Mac OS now. The second thing is I'm running on a hypervisor, or running Linux in a hypervisor, right? The next thing is foo goes from being in Linux to being a volume that, for, that Docker owns, right? But it still looks like bar and baz to C1 and C2. Um, and so the question then at that point is, well, I'm running this on Mac OS or whatever, and Docker owns this volume. How do I see the data on my Mac, right? Well, what I did is, in the instructions as well, I made a container that you can use um, for Samba. And so if you followed all the setup instructions, um, you would run this command, which says, hey, go start this Samba container for me so I can see my data. So then what it does is it goes and creates a Samba container that has a work dir in it. And it says, OK, expose that back to Mac OS, essentially over IP, right? So I guess what I wanted to try to show with this diagram is from the hypervisor up, it looks exactly the same as it did before, right? It's the same thing. Linux. <laughs> um, so here it is running on the Mac. So the first thing I go do is I run Docker because it's just an application on Mac OS, right? And you see it starting up in the top right very tinily. There's a little whale with containers on it animating. So I run a terminal. And I run a browser. And so the first thing I'm going to do, because I'm running, going to run the toaster container, is I'm going to go to localhost 18,000. And there's nothing there, right? So now I'm going to go back to my terminal that's, that's the, it's just iTerm. And I'm going to run the exact same command that I was running before, except right here you see I have my volume instead of slash foo, right? Because this is a volume that I've created. Um, but other than that, it's the exact same toaster command as when I was running it in Linux. So I run this. Very slow typer. I should have sped that up, too. And the, this is very familiar, right? It's starting toaster. So let's go back over to the web browser and just hit Enter and see what happens now. Oh, there's something there. It's the toaster web page. So this is all running you know, on the Mac and the hypervisor. So now I'm going to go over and just open a new terminal, or new tab, where I'm going to go start that Sama container that I had mentioned. Right? That's all you do after you've done the setup. So now you can open Finder, which is that's what you do on Mac, explore or whatever. And um, you can say, and that's really tiny, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, but what I'm typing in is, the, is essentially the URL of where my Samba server is at, and it's the work dir share. Now, if you're super, um, or you have super ocular capabilities, and you can see that that says 127.0.0.2 instead of 1, this is a quirk of Mac, and I'm more than willing to talk to you about that after, but we detail that in the instructions and how to get that to work. It's just something you have to do. Um, so now I connect to that server. I say, hey, I'm a guest, right? And oh, there's my output. And God, it's so tiny. Um, I promise you what it says is build. <laughs> And um, if I go up into my <clears throat> container and I ls, I see toaster sqlite and toaster web. And, but down here, down here in my nice Mac file browser, I can see the same files. So if somebody uses Mac and that's what they're used to, this, is, this would be familiar to them. 
So I go over into Toaster, and I'm just going to build core image minimal exactly the same way as I would have before. Now, I only gave my hypervisor two cores and eight gigs of RAM. So this takes much, much longer. Um, I still sped it up for you, though. Um, but if you pay attention, I think it says like two hours and 24 minutes or something like that. Um, is that what it says? Ah, uh, yeah. So it's a really long time, but I'm using not a lot of resources. Um, so I can go over here, and I can see now I'm clicking on the output directory, going to the deploy, um, and I can see my images now in my completely in Mac land, right? Or the magic is happening to convey to the user that they are doing the normal Mac things that they would usually do. Um, and that's what I'm shooting for. Um, and I will say that when I started working on this, I had no intention of doing Mac or Windows, honestly. Um, that was just kind of a gift from the Docker people with the fact that they've made their hypervisor so transparent. Because, yeah, you can do this with VirtualBox and all of these other ways, right? That's not anything new. But the transparency of, oh, I just open a terminal and I run the exact same commands that I showed you in all the other demos and workflows is this that idea of, like, I've set up a workflow around Docker that works. Why not do it on the Mac? Why not do it on Windows if they um, help me out with doing this nice hypervisor? And I guess the question would be, what about Windows? Um, well, there are instructions for Windows for Windows 8.1. And so, and it uses the Docker toolbox, which I'm not particularly fond of because it actually do, it tries to be helpful and it installs VirtualBox and still tries to be transparent, but it's not quite as nice as on the Mac. On Windows 10, where you have Hyper-V, it follows much more this, um, this mode of like, oh, wow, it's really transparent, right? Because you're, it's using Hyper-V as a hypervisor, and so it doesn't have to install anything else. I don't yet have instructions for Windows 10 on the wiki. Um, we intend to do that, or if you're particularly motivated and really want that, I mean, you can help out and, and write some. It's really straightforward. Um, all right, does anybody have any questions? Yes? Well, yeah. oh, yes, thank you, Tim. Yeah. How about now? Yes. Okay. So how do you, ver the question is, how do you version your code uh, with your build environment? So let me make sure I'm, un I'm understanding what you're asking. Um, are you talking about the changes to the metadata or? Uh, well, you might want to upgrade Yocto at some point. Right, so the trick is that I'm putting all of the stuff that is persistent in this work directory that has nothing to do with the container, right? So you just do that however you want, right? Because it's not, it's not attached to the container in any mechanism whatsoever, right? So you go clone Pocky and you put it in a directory and the container is just running command. It's just letting you run the command. So it's just a fancy wrapper of, if you go to the Yocto project, um, uh, reference manual, and you look at it says you've got to install Git, you've got to install all of these other things, right? It's it's a quick way to say I don't have to do that, and then I can use this distro, this distro, this distro. But you don't have to clone inside of the container. Actually, my workflow that I do is I actually bind mount multiple, which is an advanced thing, and I'm more than happy to talk to you about it later. But I bind mount multiple directories in there. One of them is my source directory, one of them is my build directory, and all of these other ones, right? So it doesn't all have to be in the work directory. The reason I set this up is so that it's a, or I did it that way, so that it's an easy introduction or quick way to get into it, and then you can do it as flexible as you want. But except in the case of Toaster, Toaster actually does have um, a clone pocket, and we actually keep multiple versions of the images out there. So you can use one based on Morty, you can use one based on actually master, and you can use Toaster based on, I guess, Krogoth is out there. So in that particular case where we have actually cloned a version of something, we have multiple versions. But for the Pocky container and the extensive SDK container, it doesn't matter. 
because all the, all the code is coming from the user. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I might, I might follow up with you after Okay, this. absolutely. Yes. Oh, Mike. Okay. Well, it's being it just, too, so, really yeah. so I actually have a couple of questions, and you mm -hmm. can stop me. When. Okay. So uh, I, I've been using a, Yoc, a Docker container for mm -hmm. like three years now to build, mm -hmm. and your design approach is a little different than mine, so that's where my questions stem from. Okay. You kind of hand-waved over user ID. Uh, so by default, the containers will be root. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you're creating a container because... Uh, Pocky does not like to be built with root. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you handling user IDs? Um, I could actually probably do a talk on that. Um, okay. Of like how I got um, quick is um, so the, that's what's that's one of the things that's magic about the work dir unless you pass in arguments. Okay, it looks like the UID and the GID of the work dir. I've set up a sudoers file that allows me to run user add commands. It dynamically creates a user when it starts the container that matches that. So every single time you run the container, it dynamically creates a user inside of that container that runs what you, that lets you run what you want. So right. then you match. But you're not gonna be matched to your outside user. Yes, you are. We'll talk about that more after, the, offline. Yeah. Uh, so UIDs are not, they, they're, UID and GIDs are inode, okay. it's like, so you, there's if, no name attached to if, them. If you're fetching the outside UID and GID, then the Mac should just work just fine without having to do Samba. That yes, it does. It okes okay. yeah, so yes. you don't need to do yes, Samba. Yes, it, okay. it's for, because I was doing the cross, when I did originally, when I originally, did, that would not work on Windows, right? Correct, yes, so, yes. So yes, it would, so you do not have to use a volume for Mac. Right. It would, and he actually does bind mount okay. directory straight from the. Yeah, because yeah. I was. Yeah. That's on my map. But there, there's a bit of work that I did. I, I wrote a little uh, application called user setup, and, and I did the suitor thing because I won't let you actually create a user that has the zero ID. And that's not for security. That's for me to try to prevent the user from shooting themselves in the foot. Right? I accidentally ran as root, and I didn't mean to. Uh, and I guess last question would be, why all the distros? Why not take an approach of just dumb it down and present the container. So like, for example, I have all the people that I work with, mm -hmm. alias, well, I just have a script like containerize, mm -hmm. and it's like, just install that, and alias bitbake and dev tool to containerize bitbake, containerize dev tool. That way you would abstract away all the fact that there's a container involved at all, and you could dumb it down for people even more. And you can write whatever wrappers you want around this. I'm, I'm saying, yeah. like, advocating it so that there is one blessed build environment. You, you see, what I'm, does, does that make sense? Well, I'm not, well, because I'm not trying to push a particular build environment. I'm trying to give people flexibility, right? Or actually, it, I was trying to give me flexibility, okay. right? And in my scenario, the multiple distros are very important. Um, and I mean, there, was, there are numerous times where, you know, I'm, chatting with the Yocto development team in IRC, and they're like, oh, this doesn't look like this works on this distro. And I'm like, well, let me try it real quick, because I can just do it in the workspace I'm already in. Sure. Right? That's really important to me. Um, and so I guess that's one thing I want to say, is I'm not trying to push this as the solution. Um, this is just something that I hope that if it's helpful to other people, they could either use it as an example, or build upon it, or whatever they want to do. Um, looking at things as there being one solution, that's very good for individual teams, and I highly suggest that, right? Like, like script the heck out of it, right? Um, but the, what I tried to do is, if you notice, I, say, I don't say download the script and, or run curl and you know, pipe it, or run wget and pipe it to something else. That's a common way that people do things now. I was trying to be sort of transparent because I also want to teach people like what's happening, and maybe that's a wrong thing for me to do, but that's how I approached it when I was doing this. But you can, it's like I said, I, if you have great ways of doing things, I'm interested in hearing them because um, the more I learn, it's, the better it's gonna get, right? So I think that's why I put the problem slide in there is try to show like, here's why there's like 13 different containers or whatever. Yes, uh, you wanna? Uh, 
you showed uh, like five or six different distros that you're running, but uh, are they all just using the same kernel that uh, you're uh, running in the host? Yeah, and because uh, these different distros are all based on different versions of the kernel. That's why I'm asking this question. And uh, how does that keep your uh, interoperability tests uh, valid? Well, the first thing I'm not using the containers to do interoperability tests. I'm doing them. I'm using them to quickly test things that are pro that probably aren't kernel related, right? So yeah, if you if you want an isolated build environment is the only way that I think that you can really do it right now is to do a VM and not even use uh, hardware extensions. I mean, if you really want to be crazy anal about it, right, you can't even let it use hardware extensions because then your hardware is impacting what you're running as well, right? That's probably never going to matter, um, but you can go completely in that direction. I did this more as a, a flexibility thing of like, or for instance, another great example is I upgrade to Fedora 25, right? And the compiler now lo no longer builds um, OE Core Pocky because it's too new, right? Well, now I just go use my container and I can still build it, but still keep my you know uh, workstation distro as new as I want, or use Arch, for instance, which is yeah. Um, so there might be issues with the kernel, but except for major um, ABI changes across like system calls and things like that, you usually wouldn't run into a problem. And that's what most people who run containers are assuming as well, that run them across enterprise, right? Just resources, um, you mentioned your wiki mm -hmm. and the deck. Uh, do you have URLs for those? Uh, um, so, and yeah, so the original was that wiki URL, and then this is all of the individual containers. Um, and I think, the, I think the wiki actually links to these two, and if it doesn't, we need to make it do that. Um, what's the URL? Uh, what's that? Yeah, this is our graphic designer that made me pick that color, so. <laughs> no, I can't easily, honestly. Um, Made mine orange. Did you? What, what's the wiki for? Oh. Uh, These slides are already online, right? Yeah. So you can go to the ELC website and actually click a slides link and download all of these. Um, yeah, that's it, right? So just another example of how to use this. I used his same infrastructure to test because I, I was supporting the uh, Eclipse plugins for Yocto Project. And I needed to find out for the new distros what was the minimum install in order to allow the Eclipse plugin to be built. And I did it with these containers. All I did was change a little bit about what was installed and what it was running. So this uh, framework that he's done is really extensible. And I was going to do my DevTool demo uh, talk with, with the containers on the Mac, mm. but I had one package that I needed to demo that didn't build cleanly, and we haven't figured out why yet, and so that's why I didn't do that. No more questions? I'm going to keep this really quick. Uh, on Windows 10, has it been tried but not documented yet, or is it in process? Yeah, so, and I'll just tell an anecdote with it. Is So I have a Windows 10, and I should have clarified, it's Windows 10 Pro is the only one that has Hyper-V in it, right? That's t I don't know why Microsoft decided to do that, but that's the way it is right now. They may change it, but um, Pro and essentially up. Um, so I have a laptop, it's a Xeon laptop. I didn't, I got it from somebody else. I didn't even know they put Xeons in laptops. But um, is, and it had four cores. And my workstation is a Xeon that um, has like 20 cores or something like that. And, and so what I did is just a test, um, doing this on Windows 10, is I did a build on um, on my Linux workstation, and I basically used uh, I limited the CPU set. Essentially, I said no, you only get four cores, right? And to try to mimic the Windows laptop that I have, I did that, 
And my uh, Linux workstation is actually an older rev of Xeon than the laptop was, right? So I did that. And then I went and I did the build on my laptop. And it was actually faster on my laptop than it was on my Linux workstation because it's because of the improvements that they've made to the Xeon, right? So I basically faked out using containers the build to say, you're only four cores. And I still, so yeah, it works on Windows. And if you have the hardware, I mean, the performance isn't going to be that much worse either. It shouldn't be, at least uh, from what I've seen. But yeah, I've ran it on Windows 10 Pro. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Mac instructions would, for the most part, be the same as the Windows 10 instructions. You would go download Docker and install it and then do those other commands. Um, I just haven't expanded that on the wiki yet. All right, thanks.